Hello class, this is chapter 14 regarding using financial information and technology. These are the learning outcomes. If you read through each of these questions of the learning outcomes, you can find the answers to these learning outcome questions in your chapter outline and your textbook. This is an exhibit of 14.3, the accounting system. This is exhibit 14.4 in terms of how the reports are provided by the accounting system when it comes to internal and external. Internal reporting related to manager accounting talks about sales reports, operation costs, and detailed financial reports within the company, basically telling you how the company is doing internally and the operations. The external reporting in terms of financial accounting is giving a balance sheet and income statement and statement of cash flows. This gives an idea for investors whether they want to invest in the company or not, giving the investors your financial health, the big picture of the company. Is it making a profit? For section one of the learning objective or learning outcome, why are financial reports and accounting information important and who uses them? These concept checks, as you read through the chapter, you'll find the answers to these. And also not only that, again, refer to the chapter outlines. This is a video on GAAP versus IFRS. Let's take a look at this video. U.S. GAAP versus IFRS. U.S. GAAP, United States generally accepted accounting principles. IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. U.S. GAAP and IFRS are the two main accounting standards in the world for use by publicly listed companies. U.S. GAAP is developed by the FASB, the U.S.-based Financial Accounting Standards Board, headquartered in Norwalk, Connecticut. IFRS is developed by the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, headquartered in London, United Kingdom. US GAAP is obviously the standard in use in the United States, a country with a highly diverse and very large economy and a very long history of an active market for buying and selling stocks and bonds, where companies need to synchronize the way they report financial results to investors. How many countries use IFRS? the self-proclaimed global standard for global markets, the global solution for a global need. Take a guess. Here are some maps of various parts of the world with countries that require IFRS in red and countries that permit IFRS in green. According to the IFRS Foundation, 144 jurisdictions in total now require the use of IFRS standards for all or most publicly listed companies whilst the further 12 jurisdictions permit its use. So 156 countries in total. The European Union adopted IFRS standards as the required financial reporting standards for the consolidated financial statements of all European companies whose debt or equity securities trade in a regulated market in Europe, effective in 2005. In Japan, voluntary adoption is allowed since 2010 but no mandatory transition date has been established. China has continued to amend Chinese accounting standards so that its principles are generally consistent with IFRS. Indian accounting standards are based on and substantially converged with IFRS standards. So if US GAAP and IFRS are different accounting standards, should this topic only be interesting for accountants? Quite the opposite. Of course, accountants, CFOs and finance directors need to have the most in-depth knowledge of how accounting standards work, but many others should have at least a high-level understanding. It is essential for any investor to understand how US GAAP and IFRS work. It is very important for anybody comparing the performance of companies, business leaders, stock market analysts, business developers, marketing leaders. There are several high quality documents that can help you understand similarities and differences between US GAAP and IFRS in great detail. 
the 52-page SEC document from 2011. Or more recent publications like the 51-page document from accounting firm Ernst & Young, KPMG's 515-page handbook, Deloitte's 72-page publication and PwC's 237-page guide. Or maybe get a high-level idea first by watching this Finance Storyteller video. Let's take an example in the oil and gas industry. The income statements of ExxonMobil and Shell. Both companies report their financial results in US dollars, the currency of choice for transactions in the oil business. That should make the comparison easy, right? Revenue at the top. $279 billion for ExxonMobil, $388 billion for Shell. Net income at the bottom. $21 billion for ExxonMobil, $23 billion for Shell. Now that we have found those two key numbers of revenue and net income for both companies, we can jump straight into financial ratio analysis for this year, trend analysis over the past three years, etc. Right? No, 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 no. We could be comparing apples to oranges. ExxonMobil prepares its financial statements based on US GAAP. Shell prepares its financial statements based on IFRS. If the standards you apply are different, the calculation of a number like net income is different. We have no indication what Shell's net income would have been under US GAAP, nor what ExxonMobil's net income would have been under IFRS. Comparing ExxonMobil to Chevron, US GAAP to US GAAP, is apples to apples. Comparing Shell to BP, IFRS to IFRS, is oranges to oranges. But sadly, comparing the financial performance of ExxonMobil to Shell is not possible without a lot of rough estimates, wild guesses and disclaimers. Is there any way of finding out exactly how much the difference is between US GAAP and IFRS for one and the same company in the same year, for example in the area of profitability? I have searched far and wide, but have only found one recent example of a company that provides a re recent reconciliation between their US GAAP and their IFRS numbers. One company, ASML, the world's leading supplier of semiconductor manufacturing equipment and the innovator behind ever-advancing lithography systems. ASML shares are listed for trading on NASDAQ and Euronext Amsterdam. They publish an annual report based on US GAAP, as well as an annual report based on IFRS, and the reconciliation between the two. In both 2016 and 2017, IFRS net income for ASML was higher than US GAAP net income by around $100 million per year, a difference of around 5%. Specifically for ASML, there are two main differences. The way development expenditures are treated under US GAAP, fully charged to operating expense, versus IFRS, capitalized and then amortized, and the way income tax expense and divert tax assets are rec recorded. This is a very small sample, one company in one specific industry. The same or different elements of the US GAAP and IFRS accounting standards may cause differences for other companies. Who knows? Why is it not easy to find more examples of companies that publish their financial results for both US GAAP and IFRS? There surely must be more companies like ASML that have a dual listing. In other words, companies that have their shares listed in the US, NYSE or NASDAQ, as well as somewhere else in the world. Yes, there are plenty of those companies, around 500 to be more precise. Under the current rules of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, foreign issuers, corporations incorporated under the laws of any foreign non-US country, are allowed to use IFRS financial statements in their registration statements and periodic reports. This saves foreign issuers a lot of time, money and effort, as they don't have to prepare dual annual reports under both US GAAP and IFRS. But it's not great for global comparability. In addition, in November 2007, the SEC unanimously approved a proposal that no longer requires foreign registrants to reconcile the financial statements with US GAAP, as long as they use IFRS as issued by the International Accounting Standards Board. So there are lots of examples of US GAAP to IFRS comparisons for 2006, but few to none for more recent financial years. And let's face it, 
2006 in today's VUCA world is pretty much ancient history. If you do find a recent example of a company publishing both US GAAP and IFRS numbers and the reconciliation between them, then please let me know in the comment below. So if you can't start a comparison between US GAAP and IFRS from a sufficiently large sample of actual differences for real life companies, let's take a look at the possible differences that could occur. US GAAP and IFRS each provide a way to map economic events onto financial reports, providing principles, rules and guidance to book accounting journal entries and put together financial statements. For most common transactions, there are more similarities than differences between US GAAP and IFRS. However, it is important to realize that significant differences in treatment can and do occur. Some differences are cosmetic. If we compare the balance sheets of two companies, that we discussed earlier, ExxonMobil and Shell, we find that ExxonMobil, US GAAP, lists assets from most liquid to least liquid, and Shell, IFRS, lists assets from least liquid to most liquid. A cosmetic difference, you just have to look in a different place for the information you need. What is more worrisome is substantive differences, differences in the way revenues and expenses are recorded in the income statement. Differences in how assets, liabilities and equity are valued on the balance sheet. And differences in how cash flow items are classified on the cash flow statement. Let's zoom out to the big picture on US GAAP versus IFRS. US GAAP is mostly rules based, while IFRS is mostly principles based. What does rules based versus principles based mean? Here's a metaphor that viewers with children or those that grew up with a brother or sister might relate to. The two ways to run a family. Some parents use a rules based system. They tell their kids which behaviors are allowed and what is prohibited. You can't kick or punch your brother or sister, but you may give him or her a hug. Other parents may use a principles based system. In this family, we are nice and friendly to each other. Is rules based better than principle based? Or is principles based better than rules based? I don't think one is better than the other, each has advantages and disadvantages. With rules you try to provide clarity and be specific. The more specific the guidance, the more consistent the application, right? Or not quite. Unfortunately, in the case of families, by making a list of rules you might also encourage children to try things behind your back as a parent. Kids might test the limits of the rules. And your list of rules is probably never ever going to be complete to describe each and every possible interaction between siblings. An equivalent of this in the US GAAP accounting standards is the use of bright lines. When the FASB specifies a percentage as a minimum or maximum for applying a certain rule, companies might adapt their behavior to just meet the minimum requirements, complying with the letter of the standard, but not necessarily with the spirit of the accounting standard. With principles, you leave a lot of room for interpretation. Different people might each have their own subjective interpretation of the principle. Opponents of principle-based structures would say that the lack of detailed rules might lead to more abuse, and in the business context, to different interpretation for similar transactions. Neither system will be perfect, and it is not easy to find an optimal mix between rules and principles that works best. A rules-based standard like US GAAP is definitely more sizable than the principles-based standard like IFRS. Estimates of the size of US GAAP versus IFRS vary from 7200 pages of US GAAP when printed versus 1300 for IFRS to 25000 pages of US GAAP to 2000 pages for IFRS. Whether it's a 6 to 1 ratio or a 12 to 1 ratio, rules-based is more extensive. This remains one of the criticisms of US GAAP by practitioners, a standards overload with too much detail and a high level of complexity. It is important to understand that both US GAAP and IFRS are changing over time. New industries emerge, new types of uh, transactions occur, and the thinking about how certain economic transactions need to be treated accounting-wise changes. Some years, big impact changes in the standards occur. In other years, the number of changes might be large, but the impact fairly low. 
and sometimes things are fairly quiet in the area of standard setting. So even if you compare numbers for one and the same company over a large number of years, you might be comparing various types of apples. An interesting question is whether US GAAP and IFRS will converge, grow more close, or diverge, grow further apart. The FASB and IASB have been working together over the years to try to develop common standards in various areas. A success story in convergence between US GAAP and IFRS is the new standard for recognizing revenue from contracts with customers, ASC 606 in US GAAP and IFRS 15 in IFRS, effective 2018. With the exception of a few fairly minor areas, the new model eliminates many of the existing differences in accounting for revenue between the two frameworks, as revenue is, for most companies, the biggest line item in the profit and loss statement, it is great for comparability if recognition of revenue is synchronized between the two accounting standards. A project with mixed results is the new standard for leasing, ASC 842 in US GAAP and IFRS 16 in IFRS, effective 2019. While both new standards basically require lessees to recognize right of use assets and li lease liabilities on their balance sheets, there are significant differences between the standards. The new standards narrowed the differences, but did not eliminate them. What are some examples of areas where US GAAP and IFRS could yield very different outcomes? Measurement, recognition and valuation of financial instruments is one such complex area. Valuation of inventory is another, with the question whether to LIFO or not to LIFO as a central theme. LIFO is acceptable under US GAAP, but prohibited under IFRS. Inventory value on the balance sheet tends to be lower under LIFO, last in, first out, than under FIFO, first in, first out. Therefore, cost of goods sold tends to be higher under LIFO than under FIFO, and profit tends to be lower under LIFO than under FIFO. This might sound like a trivial matter, but it makes a major financial difference. For all companies in the US that still use LIFO, to change to FIFO could generate a one-time taxable profit of tens of billions of dollars. So will listed US public companies ever be required to or allowed to transition from US GAAP to IFRS? It was certainly hinted at and discussed in the past. The SEC and Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, have been hesitant to relinquish control over accounting rules. There may be more convergent projects in the future, maximizing similarities and minimizing differences, which effectively brings US GAAP and IFRS closer. But a full transition? I think that the US adopting IFRS is as likely as the US converting to the metric system. Possible, maybe even advisable, but very unlikely. Want to learn more about business, investing and finance? Then subscribe to the Finance Storyteller YouTube channel. Thank you. Okay. These are some questions to consider regarding US GAAP versus IFRS. Constant check two. Here is the accounting cycle exhibit. Look at the steps one through six. Concept check three. Here's a video on data analysis. Hands up if you've heard the term data analytics in conjunction with the accounting profession. We're hearing it more and more in terms of the skills we think accounting students and accounting graduates need to succeed in the profession. So in today's video, I'm gonna talk about what is data analytics, um, why it's important for your career and free tools software and courses that you can use to skill up in this particular area. Let's get into it. Hi everyone, Dr. Amanda White here. For those who are returning, hi, it's great to see you again. For those who are new, my name is Dr. Amanda White. I'm a chartered accountant. I have a PhD in behavioral audit. I teach accounting and audit at university, and I'm a real 
advocate um, and I'm really passionate about accounting as a career and one that's open to everyone. So today I wanted to talk about something that is really important for accounting students and graduates or those looking to come into the accounting professional, bone up their skills in the accounting profession, and that is data analytics. Now, what exactly is data analytics? It's really using financial and non-financial data to help companies make better decisions. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a second, haven't we already been using data in accounting forever? That's absolutely true because we've been using data in the accounting profession since Pacioli, all right? Since the time of double entry bookkeeping, we've been using accounting data and non-accounting data to help firms make decisions. Now, why are we talking about data analytics today um, when we've been doing it all this time? Well, really, it's the significant volume of data. We're certainly hearing the words big data, or if you're in the United States or North America, you'll hear big data. Um, that is, is really what's changing things. We're collecting data and it's accessible about all sorts of different things, buying habits, um, web browsing habits, where we're making our phone calls, what we click on on Instagram, what goes in our shopping carts. So there is so much data available now because of the computerization of systems. Now I'm gonna put a link here to a great video by Professor Julie Smith David. She is one of the pioneers really um, in this area. She was talking about big data and um, Professor Bill McCarthy from Michigan State University have been talking about computerization and accounting data and all of that for a really long time. But Julie has a really great video from an American Accounting Association seminar a number of years ago about big data, as the Americans call it, and why it's always been a thing for us as accountants. So for accountants, this is nothing new. We're just learning about different contexts in which it can apply. Now, of course, in terms of study options, you could choose to do an entire degree on data science, data analytics. Now, if you're going into that data science, data analytics area, there's certainly lots of programming. So most data analytics courses will get into programming in things like R and Python to be able to analyze data. But what I wanna talk about today is really more the smaller scale free stuff that you can get into. Now we can use all sorts of things and tools for data analytics. The simplest one is Excel. Everybody knows Excel, um, or hopefully you know Excel. There's certainly lots of channels on YouTube where you can learn about Excel, but Excel is probably the basic one. In terms of tools and free courses with Excel, I'm gonna link you to Wendy Teets. She is a professor at Kent State University in the US. Hi Wendy, she and I are friends. She has a great little YouTube tutorial about how you can use Excel for data analytics. And check out her website as well. There's plenty of information there about how you can use to learn Excel for data analytics yourself. On top of Excel is a tool called Power BI, and that's developed by Microsoft. Now, Power BI on your desktop, um, a single individual license is absolutely free. And if through your institution or through your professional association, you've got access to LinkedIn Learning, which is the uh, new name for lynda.com, there's probably plenty of free courses that you can do inside LinkedIn Learning that will help you learn Power BI. There's also some Power BI for accountants that are out there. I'll put everything that I've found that's useful for you in the description so that you can go and check it out. But Power BI is free. It's really just an amped up version of Excel. Another option that's really popular these days is a product called Tableau. Now Tableau does cost money, but if you're a student or you're an educator, you'll get a free 12 month license by writing to Tableau, providing them with your student details. And then they also have some training and tools um, and free courses that you can do to learn Tableau and its power as a data analytic and data visualization tool. Another piece of software that's really common in the audit space when it comes to data analytics is a tool called IDEA. And IDEA is not new. IDEA was a tool when I was an auditor more than 20 years ago and certainly beefed up a lot since then, but it is the original data analytics tool for audit besides the proprietary software owned by um, the big four and the second tier firms. IDEA is not easily available. Some universities will have licenses to IDEA through their institution, but there is the ability to actually contact IDEA and the company that makes IDEA Caseware 
if you're a student to be able to get access to a student license and free student training resources that's something worth looking into if you're specifically looking at a tool that um, a lot of audit firms do use. The next tool I have for you for learning about data analytics is an absolutely free, I said a free virtual internship through KPMG and a program called Inside Sherpa. You'll get an idea of KPMG's data analytics methodology. It's a free online course, you get a little certificate of completion at the end, um, and that's open to everyone, anyone. You don't need any special software for it. Um, it's all contained within the website. Inside Sherpa offers virtual internships on all sorts of different things so that you can try and gain some experience if you can't actually get off campus and you're a student or you can't get into an audit practice. Now that's not quite the same as real hands-on internships, but it's a really good place to start. The very last item I have for you in the free ways to learn data analytics is PwC's Coursera course on data analytics. Now that course is free to audit. And audit just means you get to sit in, do the exercises, but you don't get any feedback. Of course, if you wanna do the assessments, you can pay for that to get a small micro-credential type of certificate that will show up on your LinkedIn learning. Why is it important that we learn about data analytics? Well, we know that data is going to drive more and more decision-making. It's going to go into algorithms that will help predict what we need to buy, where we need to go, um, public transport, schools, health, help us identify disease outbreaks. So data and the use of data is becoming ingrained into everything that we do every day. So from an accountant's perspective, understanding how to use the data we have access to to help improve corporate decision making or non-corporate decision making if you're working for a social enterprise, that is going to be really important because more and more of accounting is becoming automated. We know that um, a lot of graduate positions are sort of shrinking in terms of numbers because of the automation of accounting. So we need to find other ways that we can add value to the business. And one of those ways is using data to help us tell a story. What has been happening? Where should we go? What could we do? So data analytics is going to be one of those really important tools for the future. Now, if you have any other good free resources for learning data analytics, I'd love to hear about them and I'll add them to my list here. But as always, if you haven't already, consider subscribing to get all the latest news and accounting content. If you thought the video was useful, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. You can catch me on social media on Facebook and Instagram as Amanda Loves to Audit, on Twitter as Amanda's Audit, because I can't use Amanda Loves to Audit, it's too long. Um, but otherwise, I will see you next time. Bye. Okay. These are some questions to consider when reviewing this YouTube video. Table 14.1 shows the balance sheet of Delicious Dessert, a sample company. Balance sheet of this particular sample business continued. Concept checks for section four of the learning objective. A table regarding income statements for that same sample company, Delicious Desserts. Here are some uh, questions, concept check questions to consider for learning objective number five. This table shows the statement of cash flows for the sample Delicious Desserts company. Concept check six. And here's a video about financial statements in Excel. Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar on how to link the three financial statements. 
we're just waiting for everyone to dial in. We've got quite a few people logging on to this session. So just we'll just give everyone a minute to get logged on and then we'll get going. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can use the tool for Q&A to ask questions and some of them I may answer as we go and the rest I may leave till the end, just sort of depending on the nature of the questions. Uh, but it looks like just about everyone is logged in now, so I'm gonna get going. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us on how to link the three financial statements in Excel. This is brought to you by the Corporate Finance Institute and our mission is to advance your career. So everything we do is extremely practical and extremely skills-based so that we can teach you how to be a world-class financial analyst. The, the objectives of this session are a few things. First of all, let's just talk about why we would link the three financial statements together. What's the purpose of doing this? And then what's the best layout to do that? There are a few different ways to structure your model and I'll talk about the pros and cons of different approaches to laying out your model. Then we'll break down the actual approach to linking the three statements. It's a bit in, of an iterative approach as there are steps that you can only do after you've completed other steps. So you sort of have to go back in this circular fashion. And then I'm gonna do a live demonstration of linking these statements uh, in Excel. So this whole session will take about 45 minutes with at least about half an hour of, of Excel work. Just quickly before we get started, we assume that you have a basic understanding of accounting um, in taking this webinar. If not, we do offer a free accounting fundamentals course on our website. We also assume that you have a basic understanding of reading financial statements and interpreting them. And again, if not, we've got a free course on our site that will teach you just that. And finally, Excel skills. We will be using some Excel shortcuts, formulas, and functions. So if any of these are new to you or you want a refresher on them, please just take our free Excel crash course it's jam packed with all sorts of tips, tricks, shortcuts, formulas, and functions. All right, so let's talk about why we would link the three financial statements together. It's really the building block of all other financial analysis. Before you can do anything else, you need the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement all linked together and dynamically flowing. As, as soon as that's in place, you can start to do financial analysis. You can test scenarios, you can look at ratios, you can look at profitability metrics, all sorts of things. And then above your financial analysis, you could look at layering on a discounted cash flow model where you'd be valuing the company. You could get even more advanced by looking at an M&A model where you've got two companies that are gonna merge and you would look at pro forma metrics like accretion and dilution. And then you can get into scenario analysis and sensitivity analysis. So really, this is just to say that the three statement models, the foundation, that's why we're doing this webinar today uh, for free is we want to make sure everyone has a solid understanding of how to link the statements. And from there, you can progress to more advanced types of financial models. So there are two standard layouts when it comes to a three statement model. The first one, is based on multiple tabs. So you'll see on the bottom here, we've got different sheets for the assumptions, the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow, and supporting schedules. This is a very traditional way of laying out a financial model. Uh, it, it's common practice to do it in this fashion. But the problem with doing it in this way is that one thing is linking can be harder because you have to go between worksheets to link your formulas. And the other thing is if the model becomes very large and it's a very complicated business, there may be too many worksheets and it may get too complicated. So our preferred method is to use a single tab model. And you'll notice in this screenshot here, we just have one worksheet in the file. And instead of organizing everything horizontally, like on the left example, we've organized everything vertically. So you have your assumptions at the top, then your income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and supporting schedules. This would make an M&A model much easier because you could have each company on its own worksheet. It would also make it a lot easier 
if it's if it's a business that has multiple units and you wanted to model each of those units independently or each each of each of the countries that it operated in independently so we highly recommend the single tab model and that's the method we're going to be demonstrating in this webinar today now let's take a look at the actual approach there is an iterative approach to linking the statements you can't simply we build them from top to bottom. You start with revenue and work your way down to EBIT on the income statement. However, you're gonna run into a problem with depreciation and interest as you won't have the assumptions in place that you need to know what those expenses are. So at that point, you move down to the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, you can do AP, inventory, and AR. Then you're gonna get stuck with PP&E, so you go to a separate schedule where you model PP&E on its own. And then you can get into the financing and capital structure where we make assumptions about debt and equity. When the PP&E schedule and the capital structure schedules are finished, then you can go back to the income statement and plug in depreciation and interest and finish off the income statement. Then you can go to the balance sheet and finish that off and finally do the cash flow statement. So we're going to be working through little sections of each part of the three financial statements and then finally putting it all together at the end. That I'm going to flip over to Excel. And I trust everyone has received this file in the email that we sent out. If not, please go to your email and check. You should re have received a copy of this file. I'm gonna quickly walk you through the layout. So we've got this single tab model. As you see, there's only one tab at the bottom here. It's organized by assumptions, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, and supporting schedules. So in the assumptions area, we've got these numbers here that are gonna drive the forecast of the model. And they're based on looking at what the business did historically in this section here. So we've got the historical section and then to the right of it, the forecast section. We can then open up the income statement. These are the historical numbers for this company. We simply took their financial statements and typed them into Excel. We can then see their balance sheet below that. Again, these numbers are blue because that indicates that they're hard-coded numbers, they're not formulas. Finally, this company's cash flow statement is published here. And then below that, what, what's not an actual statement, but just some working information is the supporting schedules. So there's a working capital schedule, a fixed asset schedule or depreciation schedule, and then debt and interest schedule. So what we're going to do now is we're gonna go through and build out each of these sections one by one to fill in the forecast of this model. So we'll start with the income statement. We'll do this top section. Then we'll get down into the balance sheet and we'll focus on these working capital items. Then we'll move all the way down to these supporting schedules and fill those in. Back up to the income statement to do interest and depreciation taxes, then back to the balance sheet, and you get the idea. So this is that iterative approach that we spoke about earlier, where we can only do things one at a time. So let's start with revenue. If you have this open, please work along with me. Otherwise, you can just watch my screen. But we're going to calculate revenue based on a year over year growth rate. So it's going to be equal to prior year revenue times one plus some growth rate. Cost of goods sold is gonna be a function of revenue and a cost of goods sold margin. And then gross profit is gonna be equal to revenue minus cost of goods sold. So with those in place, I can fill them right with control R. If you want a review of these Excel shortcuts, please take our Excel crash course, it's free, and it will teach you how to quickly fill things in just the way I am. So that, that was fairly straightforward. We've got a growth rate assumption for revenue and a margin assumption for COGS. Then we get into the expenses. So we've said that salaries and benefits is a fixed cost. It's not a percentage of revenue. So we simply link to an assumption that has a dollar value. Same with rent and overhead. We've said rent and overhead 
is going to be constant over time. It's not going to grow with um, revenue. So we, so we put those in place and we can fill them right with control R. But then we get down to depreciation. And you'll notice in the assumptions that depreciation is based on a percentage of property, plant, and equipment. Or it could be a more complicated form of depreciation like straight line, but we've said, okay, it's a declining balance, whatever type of depreciation assumption you want, it's gonna be a function of property, plant, and equipment. So, so we're kind of stuck. And then interest here, we also can't complete because interest is dependent on the debt balance and we don't have anything on our balance sheet yet. Taxes, we also can't do because we don't know what the earnings before tax are. So we're, we're kind of stuck here. So now what we do is we go down to the balance sheet and we say, okay, we can model accounts receivable, inventory and accounts payable because we have revenue and cost of goods sold already in place. So accounts receivable is simply the percentage of revenue that's left unpaid at the end of the period. So our accounts receivable, our accounts receivable is gonna be based on revenue multiplied by the assumption we have for the number of days uh, receivable or outstanding divided by 365 to convert it to dollar value. So, so that would be our accounts receivable at the end of the period. We can also calculate our inventory because we have an assumption about inventory turns and inventory is a function of cost of goods sold multiplied by the average days that it takes for our inventory to turn over, which in this case we're saying is 73 days, divided by 365. So we multiply the cost of goods sold by the average inventory days and then divide it by 365 to get this dollar value of inventory. So I can fill those right. So account, just to, just to review this, because it's not the most intuitive, accounts receivable is a function of revenue because we've, we've recognized revenue for this business, but we have not necessarily been paid for all that revenue. And if we have 18 days on average that it takes to receive our, our revenue as actual payment, then we can multiply revenue by 18 divided by 365. So that's the proportion of the year that's unpaid at the end. For inventory, we do the same thing. We take cost of goods sold and multiply it by the days uh, that it takes to turn inventory divided by 365. Okay, now we can move down and do accounts payable as well. So just like accounts receivable, accounts payable is gonna be based on a, a days assumption, a number of days, but it's gonna be applied to expenses, not to revenues. So the expenses that we will assume that we have payable terms on are cost of goods sold. There could be some other items on the income statement that have payable terms, but for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna assume that cost of goods sold is the only thing where we have payment terms. And we'll say 37 days is what we take to pay our bills. So we'll multiply it by 37 and divide it by 365. So that's the percentage of cost of goods sold that are unpaid for at the end of the year. So I can fill that right. So at this point now we've got our working capital completed with our accounts receivable, our inventory and our accounts payable. We've kind of chipped away at what we can do on the balance sheet. And, and once again, we're kind of stuck though because we don't know what property, plant and equipment is gonna be. We don't have a debt number and we don't have what we need to finish this section either. So we're kind of stuck. So this is where we now continue to move on. We don't get discouraged even though we don't have those numbers. We just move on down and we'll build some schedules at the bottom here. These are very simplified versions of the schedules you would build for an operating company. Typically, there would be a lot more detail here, but what we can do is, first let's do our property plant and equipment schedule. So what we have here is an opening balance 
which is the same as last period's closing balance. We add to it by spending capital on PP&E, either buying additional equipment or investing in the existing. And then we deduct from it with depreciation. So let's fill in this schedule. We call this a corkscrew calculation because it pulls the numbers through like a corkscrew shape. So the opening balance is equal to last period's closing balance. The additions are up in the assumption section where we are adding this number here in the form of capital expenditures to our capital asset base. And then we're saying that depreciation, and this is just a very basic assumption, we're saying that depreciation is, is a function of the opening balance times our depreciation rate, which we've said is 40%. Now, in reality, you may have a more detailed schedule than this. There may be a more complex calculation, but for illustrative purposes, this will show you how to connect the statements. So depreciation is 40% of the opening balance. So then we get our closing balance, which is opening, plus our capital expenditures, and then minus our depreciation. The closing balance is what we need to put on the balance sheet. So once we have that filled, we can select all this area and press Control R to fill it right. Let's also build out the debt and interest schedule. So it's a corkscrew calculation again, just like the depreciation schedule. So our opening balance is equal to last period's closing balance. There's no time difference between these two. And then we have an assumption about any debt that was either repaid or additional debt that was borrowed. So this assumption here is any principal repayments or additions to our debt balance. The closing balance is simply the opening plus any issuance or repayment. And then we calculate our interest expense. Again, a very simple assumption that is the opening balance times the interest rate. Now there's all sorts of additional complexity you could add here. Of course, the opening balance is not a true reflection of what the total balance was throughout the entire year. But for simplicity's sake and to complete this model, this is a, this is a great way to do it. We avoid circular references or any other issues um, that more complicated schedules create. So now we've got this debt schedule where we have our closing balance of debt. We've got our depreciation schedule where we've got a closing property plant and equipment value. And that allows us to go up and complete uh, part more of the income statement and balance sheet because we were, we were missing these items earlier. But before doing that, let's quickly fill in this working capital schedule as well. This will help us on the cash flow statement because we need to take the changes in working capital to adjust our net income to get operating cash flow. So just as a quick recap, if accounts receivable goes up, that indicates we have not been paid for more revenue that we've um, recorded. So if accounts receivable goes up, that's going to be a drain on our cash flow. Same with inventory. If inventory goes up, presumably we've paid for that inventory. So that's also going to be a reduction of cash. Accounts payable works in the opposite direction. With accounts payable, if it, accounts payable goes up, that means we have not paid bills. So that's a source of cash. If our accounts payable went down, we would lower our cash because we cleared out all those bills that we owed. So that's the quick recap on uh, changes in working capital. So all we had need to do here is just link to the balance sheet where we've already calculated accounts receivable. Inventory is right below that, so I can copy the formula down. And then accounts payable, I can link to the balance sheet right there. So to calculate the net working capital, I'm just gonna copy this formula over. I take accounts receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. I get my total net working capital. But what I need to know 
for cash flow calculations is the change in networking capital, not just the total balance. And that's what this line below is calculating. It's saying what, what has been the change in networking capital over this period, and that impacts my cash flow. Because as you will see here, AR has gone up, so that's a bit of a drain on cash. Inventory has gone up, also a drain. But accounts payable has gone up, which is an offset. So the net effect is actually very small. There's just a very small increase in working capital. So with this in place, I can press Control R to fill that right. So our supporting schedules are done here. And now we can go back up to the income statement. And you'll remember where we got stuck here with depreciation and interest and taxes. Well, now we can fill those in because we have depreciation down in this schedule. So I can go to my depreciation assumption here, J94, and press enter. I can also pull forward the interest expense that's down in this debt schedule. So here's my interest expense in J101. And then I can take these two rows and selecting the area and pressing Control R, I fill it right. These formulas down here, total expenses and earnings before tax, these can actually just be copied over since we had them in, in those other cells. So we're simply copying over the total for expenses and then taking the difference between gross profit and expenses here to calculate earnings before tax. With earnings before tax in place, I can finally calculate our tax expense, which is EBT times the tax rate assumption of 28%. Again, just a disclaimer, this is a very simplified approach to calculating taxes. There are all, all sorts of nuances with current taxes and future taxes, et cetera. But for now, the exercise is to complete the three financial statements. So we're gonna keep all of our assumptions very simple. And, and we can now complete this income statement here with a very simplified approach to taxes. That gets us to net income. So that's great news. We've got the income statement done. But if I go back down here, still quite a few holes on the balance sheet. And of course the cash flow statement is, is completely empty. But let's chip away here. We've built this property plant and equipment schedule down below. So, so we can now fill in the PP and E line on the balance sheet. So let's go down to our PP and E schedule and we can select the closing balance for PP and E right here. And I'm gonna fill that to the right. With that in place, I'd also like to take this subtotal here of total assets and fill it to the right. So now this is all linked up. Cash is gonna be the very last thing we do. This will be our, our final piece that tells us if the model's working or not. So we're gonna save that. But, but scrolling down here, we know that we've got the debt schedule now. So I can fill in debt. So I'm gonna go down to the debt closing balance, J100, and just link that in. I can then also copy across this subtotal. So by I'm filling all these right with Control R. So now what I've got here is liabilities completed because of our debt schedule and our accounts payable that we calculated earlier. But then we've got equity capital. Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, you can watch the remaining about 20 minutes of this video. It's a long video. Here is a disclosure of a ratio analysis for the company Delicious Desserts. And if you look at this um, formula, you could see how to calculate the current ratio, the asset test ratio, networking capital, and the profitability ratios. Now, you'll learn a lot more about these ratios in detail if you take accounting, financial accounting. And I think that might be a good class to kind of 
understand the analysis of numbers and what they mean. Section seven of how can racial analysis be used to identify a firm's financial strength and weakness? This is a learning objective number seven. Here are some concept checks related to learning objective seven. Remember again, if you look at your chapter outlines, you can see the information regarding these questions. Here's some uh, information about tools. If you click on any of these hyperlinks, you could, you could take a look in detail from the textbook. Here's a video. I'm Larry Walther. This is principlesofaccounting.com, Chapter 16. This module considers tools for financial statement analysis. Now, Recognize that CPAs and the Securities and Exchange Commission and so forth provide safeguards to ensure the integrity of reported financial information. That's entirely different than suggesting that a particular company might be a good investment. In other words, a report that shows that a company has more debt than assets and is losing money, that can be reported with great integrity, and those financial statements might be filed and accepted with the SEC and audited by a CPA, that doesn't guarantee that something's a good investment. So someone needs to look at financial reports when they're considering loaning money or making an investment in the company. They need to look at financial statements very carefully and see what information is communicated. And throughout the textbook, you've seen a number of ratios that have been illustrated. I tried to integrate each of the ratios that are, that are typical into the textbook, through the textbook, as, as those subjects made sense. The, the ratios are key metrics or key indicators that can be used to summarize financial position, performance, and so forth, and use that for a comparative basis with other companies. What I wish to do next is review the ratios that you've been exposed to in your studies to this point. Ratios can be divided into certain types or categories of ratios. I've identified two liquidity ratios. Liquidity or a company's cash or near to cash position, its ability to meet obligations as they come due. In chapter four, we saw the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. On the far right are some calculations of a current ratio for Emerson Corporation. In the textbook, the financial statements for Emerson Corporation are presented. You might want to open up or look alongside in your textbook and see if you can find the amount for current assets, current liabilities to come up with that ratio. You can pause the video if you need to. Another ratio is the quick ratio. It's a measure of liquidity also. It's even tied to a more stringent definition of liquidity though. Rather than looking at total current assets, it looks at the current assets that are very near to cash, which include cash, short-term receivables, and account receivables, divided by the current liabilities. And there again is the value for Emerson Corporation. It appears in both cases that Emerson's Corporation liquidity as expressed to the current ratio and the quick ratio are both in pretty good shape. Another family or category of ratios are the debt service ratios. We have debt to total assets that was introduced in chapter 13. It's the percentage of assets that are financed by long-term and short-term debt, total debt divided by total assets. A similar ratio is debt to total equity, where we divide total debt by total equity. Times interest earned was also introduced in chapter 13. It is the amount of income before taxes and interest divided by the interest charges. Now, if you might look at other textbooks and finance books. You'll find this ratio calculated several different ways, but in the main, what it's an attempt to do is show how many times you have money available to cover your fixed interest obligation before you would run into financial stress. Emerson's apparently doing pretty good at $1,400,000 in income before taxes and interest. Their interest expense or interest charges are $100,000 for the period, so they've got their interest covered at least 14 times. Turnover ratios is another category. In chapter seven, we introduced accounts receivable turnover ratio. It measures the frequency of the collection cycle. It's used to monitor credit policies. It's net credit sales divided by average net accounts receivable. And then from chapter eight, we introduced the inventory turnover ratio, which is the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. If these ratios are changing for a particular business, it can be indications of building credit risk, a company's not collecting their receivables, or building inventory, they're not turning their inventory on a, on a consistent basis. So important to monitor those particular turnover ratios. 
We've got certain profitability ratios. Net profit on sales was introduced in chapter five. It's net income divided by net sales, often used for comparing one business to another. Companies in the same industry, you would probably expect them to have similar profit rates, but that's not always the case. Gross profit margin is gross profit divided by net sales. Of course, it compares that intermediate income number before considering all of your operating expenses. A return on assets is the net income plus the interest expense. It's how much is being made before interest divided by the average asset. So this company is generating a 28% return on its invested average assets. And return on equity is somewhat similar. We do need to subtract preferred dividends, so it's the net income less the portion that needs to be distributed as preferred dividends divided by the average common equity. And this Emerson appears to be doing quite well with a 48% return on equity. There are certainly other indicators. We looked in chapter 15 at earnings per share, which is the income available to common shareholders divided by the weighted average number of shares. We looked at the price earnings ratio, which compares the market price of the stock to the earnings per share. The dividend yield, which are the cash dividends divided by the market price per share of the stock. Dividend payout ratio, which is what proportion of the income is being paid out in dividends, or in other words, dividends divided by earnings. And then the book value per share, in common equity divided by the number of common shares outstanding. Beyond just the ratios, the textbook also presents an illustration for Emerson Corporation using common size financial statements. This is simply ratios. For example, for 20X5, cash was 17% of total assets, receivables are 21% of assets, and so it would go. That's interesting and probably apparent where the numbers come from, but also important is to monitor year to year. So for example, something that jumps out at me in this illustration is that in 20X5, long-term loans were 22% of total liabilities plus equity, whereas in the previous year it was 50%. Notice that equity is now 71% of the organization's financing the prior year, 43%. So it, it very much quickly, at a glance, tells you, you know, how things are ebbing and flowing within an organization in terms of its overall financial structure. We could do a similar presentation for a, a common size income statement. All right. So some questions to consider. The tools for financial analysis. Concept check for number eight, what major trends affecting the accounting industry today? Now, if you wanna learn more about accounting principles and concepts, I highly recommend you try and uh, take accounting one, account, financial accounting. That's something that is going to really help you not only as business majors, but I think it gives in-depth detail about the accounting practices. Thank you for uh, your time in listening to my review of chapter eight. And if you got any questions, feel free to email me, send me a Canvas message, or give me a text message, and let me know how I could assist you. Thank you.